Before I begin, I just wanted to, uh, you know, thank uh, Sybil and Jason again for such a fantastic conference. Also thank Luke for allowing me to be, you know, part of that fantastic special issue that is coming out. And also to thank Luke for having explained what, uh, you know, the Blake epiphany or the Blake hallucination uh, is about, which means that I don't have to do it anymore and everybody has the necessary context mean for my paper. Okay, so because of his epiphanic experience triggered by the songs in 1948, it is indeed Allen Ginsberg who within the Beat Circle has seen his name as readily associated with Blake's legacy. However, even if not all beat affiliates have been as vocal about their connection to Blake. It's not only over Ginsburg's own renewal of prophetic labor in today's world that Blake has loomed large, but also over that of the broader experimental beat community as a whole and over some of its contemporary inheritors. My contribution cannot exhaustively dwell on a single case study and instead privileges a survey style approach to suggest the diversity of Blake's influence on the beat inflected road of neo-shamanic questing, moving from first generation beat figures in the US to some of their contemporary descendants abroad, uh, my paper will review different attempts to revisit prophetic labor and the expansion of consciousness associated with it. But before uh, that, it is perhaps important to actually just think for a few moments about what the notion prophetic labor implies, because yes, Ginsburg and other beat affiliates are all linked to Blake, but uh, it's not you know, uh, necessarily easy at times to actually, you know, isolate the factors that bind such diverse, uh, you know, figures, such diverse temperaments and also such diverse beat styles together to uh, the, the practice of Blakean prophetic labor. So, just perhaps I mean to contextualize to anchor things a little bit and this is by no means an exhaustive definition of prophetic labor but indeed prophetic labor and I'm leaning heavily here on Tony Trigilio's book uh, you know uh, namely a book that interrogates a question of how the poet can create the moment Satan cannot find, and indeed creating the moment Satan cannot find, in Echo to Blake's Milton, seems actually uh, an endeavor that binds, I mean, the beat community together. So prophetic labor for Ginsburg and others means to reconceive apocalypse as a mode of consciousness, paradoxically redemptive and self-annihilating, rather than of past and future history, highlights Tregelio and strange prophecies anew. It also means a distrust of referentiality as a crucial point of contact between religious certainty and anti-foundationalist skepticism. Also, it means a blurring of the line between the languages of seeing and seen, presuming a reciprocal, not authoritarian relationship between subject and object. And I think, I mean, this reciprocal, not authoritarian relationship between subject and object is really central. To shift from Trigilio to Ostreicher, Alicia Ostreich also highlights that, well, prophetic labor after Blake means a willful and repeated plunge or several repeated plunges into a fallen insane world so as to give a body to falsehood that it may be cast off forever, to quote Blake. Delving deeper into the evil generated by false consciousness equals a necessary precondition for a redemption of both perceiver and perceived. 
And put differently, this also means transforming endured insanity imposed by hyper-rationalism into liberating ecstatic madness. So, all these are needed to write against what Tregilio calls the reified exemplars of science, religion, and reason, which I think really links indeed uh, the Beat sensibility to the Blakean sensibility as well. And all these, of course, also mean that for each Beat figure or Beat affiliated figure, it is actually a particular version of Blake that is nurtured a particular vision of Blake that, you know, a given poet, a given voice or artist is actually, uh, you know, particularly uh, linked to. So, oh, hang on a second. I, all right. Just, uh, you know, before we, we tackle different case studies, we survey different case studies, let me just mention, I mean, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, um, excerpts from Mind Writing Slogans, which is a book of aphorisms that Ginsburg wrote late in the day, collected late in the day, to actually synthesize his main poetic credos. And of course, Ordinary Mind includes eternal perceptions, which is Ginsburg's mean, you know, own formulation, uh, reflects upon the prophetic labor uh, that uh, Tregilio defines, that Ostriker defines, reflects upon the notion of prophetic labor, as indeed we find it, you know, put into action by Blake himself. And interestingly, in mind writing slogans, Ginsburg also quotes Blake directly with labor well the minute particulars attend to the little ones for art and science cannot exist but in minutely organized particulars. So, moving on to Ginsburg and actually uh, delving deeper into what uh, Luke has already developed in his own paper, well, it's important to understand that when you deal with the relationship between Ginsburg and Blake, what you're actually dealing with is the two contrary states of the human soul revisited through the Buddhist concept of emptiness or shunyata. And of course, emptiness is not empty uh, in the sense of nothingness or absence, uh, a thing that I repeatedly stress in class when we deal with uh, Ginsburg. Uh, emptiness means empty of permanence, empty of enduring substance, empty of immutability and empty of separateness from all other phenomena. So depending on which Buddhist school you actually cultivate, nevertheless for all Buddhist schools, I mean emptiness is actually a matrix of possibilities, a profusion of ever-changing and ever-interconnected possibilities. And that is an important element to understand. And indeed, in all his classes at Naropa and also some of the writings, I mean, that surrounded uh, Ginsburg's uh, teaching uh, uh, at Naropa, well, there is always, I mean, this highlighting of the connections between Blake's vision and the vision of Tibetan Buddhism or the vision developed also in other schools of Buddhism. And one of the important connections is indeed the sense of the Eurasianic ego that Blake, uh, Blake develops and the Tibetan Rudra, this egoic solidification, rationalistic, overly conceptualizing mind, which is indeed a mind completely cut off from emptiness and its fluidity. There is also this insistence on, well, investigating how this, I mean, solidified, rigidified ego appears and cuts itself off from the spaciousness of 
the mind that is not dualistic, the spaciousness of the mind that is also attuned to the spaciousness of mutable experience at large. So I chose here a, a quote from Your Reason and Blake's system, but there are many pronouncements in his classes and also in uh, you know his later writings that uh, tend towards uh, you know uh, seeing a commonality there between Blake's denunciation of a rigidified hyper-rational ego and indeed uh, the Buddhist uh, I mean, rejection is perhaps a bit strong, but uh, the Buddhist belief that such an ego is indeed a delusional construct. So, okay. so it's important that uh, to, to keep in mind that when you deal with the link between Ginsburg and Blake, what you're dealing with is actually a part partially dehistoricized and decontextualized Blake, not entirely dehistoricized and decontextualized. I mean, there are some uh, lectures of Naropa which clearly give a sense of Ginsburg having done his homework, having read Ertman and, you know, Foster Damon and others, as, uh, you know, Luke already mentioned. But indeed, there are also many moments in which well, Ginsburg is approaching Blake in a dehistoricized and decontextualized manner and seeing the songs as so many emblematic vignettes of mental states, vignettes that are to him compatible with the Buddhist idea that projections of the mind are empty of substance and that one's mental universe depends on the level of consciousness on which one experiences it. So the mental universe depending on the level of consciousness on which one experiences it that is again a common link between Ginsburg's interest in Buddhism between Buddhism and Blake's conception of error Blake's conception of the universe so indeed Ginsburg sees mind with a capital M as a central reality uh, for both Blake and Buddhism. And indeed, for Ginsburg, I mean, Blake understood the task of the poet as being that of materializing and transforming, I quote, the non material or imagination into human or earthly form. And so, how the songs, for instance, materialize or dematerialize the mind, show the mind solidifying actually into a rigid ego or show the mind actually still capable of being attuned to a far more spacious consciousness, a far more spacious relationship to experience. That is what fascinates Ginsburg in the songs and that is also what fascinates Ginsburg in uh, the prophetic books more generally. So, second, all right. So, <clears throat> Ginsburg actually late in life, I mean, attempted to draft a systematic study of the songs, which is still actually unpublished to this day, uh, I believe. Um, and uh, it is um, uh, actually his former secretary, Randy Rourke, which uh, possesses, who possesses the unpublished preliminary draft. So uh, in his personal archive in Boulder. So actually, I've based myself, my research on Ginsburg quite a bit on this uh, piece of writing. It was also an important uh, support to one of the chapters in my thesis um, devoted to, to Ginsburg as, uh, you know, uh, an example of uh, a Western Buddhist mirror mind expressing himself in poetry. So... It is a very startling document, I mean, to certain people, particularly to my thesis supervisor at first, because 
uh, though I won't have time to go through it, you know, case study by case study, song by song, analysis by analysis, just to give you a flavour indeed of how far Ginsburg goes when he deals actually with this dehistoricization, decontextualization of Blake, and with attempting to read Blake through uh, the framework of Shunyata, the framework of Buddhist emptiness. I've just taken here his one section of his analysis of the tiger. So the mill is kind of rudimentary with its anvil and chain. On the other hand, those are the appurtenances of loss, the poetic genius representative of imagination localized on earth. So the tiger of wrath is actually a creation of the human imagination. It doesn't exist outside. It's not a deistic or a theistic idea that's built into the universe that there's some big evil tiger waiting to get us like death or ultimate pain. Any state of consciousness is a creation of the imagination, including the tiger. So both lamb and tiger come of our own minds or our projections of our own minds, which is actually a pretty interesting idea. It's consistent with Blake, consistent with Buddhism, obviously, but not really consistent with a Christian interpretation. An absolutistic interpretation would say there's an absolute good and an absolute evil, and that evil is an existent thing, and that threat, tiger, wrath, and pain are also absolute. Blake is saying they are not absolute, but creations of the mind. They are dreams or dream illusions, real like dreams, but because transitory, not absolute, or because made up out of mind stuff, not absolute. In other words, no ultimate essential hell tiger, but tiger ourselves, which really resonates I mean, with the conception of emptiness as developed by Buddhism. So there is more to add, but because time is ticking on, I'm going to actually, you know, uh, switch to my second uh, case study, uh, Michael McClure. If you're interested in, you know, this dimension of Gensberg, uh, I have actually put on the PowerPoint references to two older articles that I published. So I apologize for the self-advertising here, but perhaps I mean that might be useful to some people. Now, in the case of Michael McClure, we are dealing with what I would call Energy is internal delight revisited as muscular imagination. Because indeed, as you can see here on the quote, which I won't read in depth, I leave, uh, you know, leave it to you to decode it whilst I, I explain things. Well, for McClure, it is indeed Blake's ability to incorporate the body, Blake's ability to incorporate, I mean, you know, the very physical with the very spiritual that actually interests McClure. And also for McClure, what is absolutely essential is this notion of energy, the fact that indeed, well, uh, there should be no rigidification, solidification of experience, but that everything is ongoing transformation, the human body included. And so McClure is incredibly interested in biology and how to actually unite the animal body biological energy with spiritual and mental energy in poetry. And indeed for him, Blake, together with Shelley, I mean, is one of the sources of inspiration, the sources of wisdom, showing the way as to how to not repress energy, how to indeed, you know, bless relaxes instead of binding imagination. So for McClure, I mean, imagination is also something physical, biological, not something that is actually disincarnated. So 
To create poetry, one must have a systemless system. A systemless system is one that alters itself in the waves with a living anarchism, like the evolution through scores of million years. Each individual's actions and patterns are a recapitulation of the old deep patterns in the meat. So I've just, uh, you know, uh, included two examples of uh, poems that not only show, indeed, the muscular imagination of McClure at work as a very sort of energetic principle, an energetic principle grounded in the breath, grounded in the body, but an energetic principle that also still refers to Blake and still refers to more abstract concepts. So, I mean, the poetry McClure produces is at the same time incredibly embodied, whilst at the same time also being, I mean, heavily abstract. But here you can also see the arrangement on the page suggesting indeed energy as eternal delight in action. And here, you know, again, on reading Patterson Loud, yes, this is pure poetry, like Blake rambling in the fields. So again, we have an arrangement on the page that, I mean, suggests expansion and contraction and suggests also, as McClure puts it in one of his other poems, peyote poem, a drug induced hallucination, that indeed the marriage of heaven and hell is possible. He even says as much as the end of the poem. I shall only surf literally on Ferlinghetti. Uh, so for Ferlinghetti, it is, I mean, the Blake of the aphorisms, uh, the Blake of the aphorisms, which actually, you know, uh, the aphorisms provide a model for proverbs of heaven and hell, proverbs of hell for a new age. So what is it the root, I think, of um, Ferlinghetti's entire approach is what Blake denounces in the Laocoon, all degraded, imagination denied, that results in war governing the nations. So this link between war governing the American nation and the degradation and deny of art and denial of imagination, that is actually a central uh, a pivotal position that unites uh, the many strands of Ferlinghetti's production. And it is also a pivotal position that underpins his own aphorisms, particularly those he produced in poetry as insurgent art. Moving to Jay DeFeo, who is a visual artist, painter, sculptor, so in the case of Jay DeFeo, uh, we have what I would call actually art, the art object and the artist both becoming sick roses unable to escape the eroding worm of materialism. Indeed, Jay DeFeo is best known for her gigantic sculpture, The Rose, a uh, sculpture which she started in 1953 and actually which uh, she remained obsessed with till her death in 89. But a sculpture whose, well, uh, strange uh, materials continued actually even to morph after DeFeo's death. Uh, and indeed, it was uh, a problem for DeFeo because she started on this gigantic uh, rose inspired by Blake. And she continued working. I mean, there were, uh, I mean, uh, the exhibition catalogue that I'm using here, the one uh, by Jane Green and Leah Levy, uh, well, really uh, is a catalogue that really shows in great detail how the rose morphed uh, 
you know, through all sorts of incar uh, uh, incarnations, from Baroque incarnations to more sort of, you know, sober incarnations to more classical incarnations, you know, to, you know, incarnations with more curves, incarnations with more lines irradiating out of the center of the sculpture. But in any event, uh, the sculpture was so monumental and heavy that Though it may not have been what De Feo intended to begin with, uh, it's acquired a sort of, you know, um, life agentiveness of its own. And indeed, it transformed itself uh, with De Feo always struggling to repair things into a sort of sick rose attacked by agentive materiality by the destructive agent of forces of the material universe and sadly and ironically too it even extended to the Feo herself because in actually trying to salvage the rose and trying to remodel and refashion it year after year well she actually inhaled a lot of toxic materials and toxic pains uh you know that caused her actually to develop cancer later in life. And it's as if actually the material universe attacking the rose of imagination in the sculpture transferred itself to her own body with she, the you know, with her, the artist, as she, the artist, actually also became attacked by the agentive force of the material universe. I mean, you know, corroding and eroding her imagination. Uh, um, De Feo is really a fascinating figure and much more needs to be written on her. So I'm going to move to two affiliated beat figures and figures I develop a little bit more actually in uh, the article I contributed to um, Luke's and Douglas's collection. So the first figure I will only very briefly touch on here is Tom Buron, a French poet, author of a trilogy entitled Nadir. And actually, when I listened to one of the papers yesterday developing how it is actually the dark romantic, how it is actually, well, uh, you know, the... Uh, um, uh, the the Blake of the the proverbs of hell of the marriage. I mean that particularly, you know, uh, well infused the whole of the French tradition. I mean, Tom Buron is actually a case in point because with him, the notion of spiritual strife, fait toi la guerre, as he repeats over and over again, is central. But it is indeed the Blake of dark romanticism. The Blake inherited from Rimbaud, allied also with Nietzsche, also the Blake inherited from uh, the Surrealists and the way in which the Surrealists also saw the prophetic books, particularly Vala and for Buron, it is a ninth night of Vala that is particularly important. So, fais-toi la guerre, the spiritual strife linked to the Blake of dark romanticism. That is a version of Blake, I mean, pervading Nadir. And Nadir is a psychomachy, is a sort of spiritual labyrinth, a little bit like, you know, Kerouac's Mexico City Blues. And indeed in which, well, the poet repeatedly plunges into madness as disease in order to provoke actually the, uh, the antidote, in order to provoke the exorcism and the journey towards madness as ecstasy and spiritual revelation. And just to finish, uh, I talk very briefly in my article for Luke and uh, Douglas about David Giannone and Daniele Bacci. Now, uh, David Giannone is a poet, okay. but so here basically what we have is Blake and Motis pervading the cartoon work and indeed the cartoon exploring actually different levels of reality. Uh, 
uh, akin to the system of correspondences that Blake actually builds in his own um, imaginary. But what is actually interesting in the case of Giannoni and Bacci is that, for instance, Bacci denies any knowledge of Blake, yet we have Blake in emblems and we have also, here you have, for example, a plane shaped like a sunflower and we have also the physical body and the vigour of the line being very reminiscent of what we find actually in Blake's own drawings. So with Giannone, what we have is actually the Blake showing as Blake showing us the problem of influence versus confluence and from, you know, our past interactions, I mean, Sibyl knows that this is one of the problems that always obsesses me. So influence and confluence, where does one begin? Where does the other end? So these are all different types of Blakes, different types of recyclings that we can find in the bead circles and uh, in the bead circle and in affiliated figures. Thank you for your attention.